that is the first in a series of the webinars that are uh, scheduled by the International Network on Salt-Affected uh, Soils. Uh, the aim of such series is to put on the, on the, on the table some aspects that uh, are interesting to discuss. And as well, there will be other uh, webinars that will try to, to help people to improve their uh, qualification and, and so this will be in, in the format of workshops and they will be in due time announced. They are under preparation and, and soon we can have a continuation of this series of webinars. The webinar of today is uh, entitled Salinity in Sub-Saharan Africa, Impacts and Initiatives. And uh, a, well, um, we have a, a distinguished uh, group of scientists, uh, quality, uh, policy makers, and other specialists that will uh, present their point today in, to, the, to the webinar. Uh, the sub-Saharan area is uh, really an area that is uh, menaced by the desertification. We, uh, all we have to uh, know about the Green Big Wall initiative trying to, to make in the Sahel area uh, to put a barrier to the advance of the deserts to the green Africa. And uh, in this case, uh, some of the countries have done a, a big effort, like Senegal, that we have here today, one representative of this country, uh, uh, Dr. Jan Sene. And uh, we have as well other, other representatives of, of the Sahel area, that is uh, Marie Dobu from Nigeria. And the other panelists are not uh, accurately sub-Saharian, but are uh, uh, as, as well, of course, under the Sahara. But uh, some of them are uh, like Tanzania, quite equatorial, and like Mozambique, like tropical South uh, Capricorn uh, tropic. So I think, I expect from today that we will get a, a uh, intense uh, and detailed uh, perspective about the problems that the desertification, in this case, uh, driven by the salinization of the soils uh, in the in the quite uh, represented in in quite all parts of of Africa under the Sahara. And uh, um, it's my my pleasure so to to welcome all attendants. And uh, I see that uh, people are making a big effort because I saw somebody from Colombia and, uh, some, and somebody from Philippines. This is a very, very uh, big difference in, in time. Uh, so they are making a, an, an effort. Thank you for your interest and for the panelists as well that have uh, done uh, 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 work uh, intense with the, our vice chair uh, Dr. Kate Negas for preparing this webinar. And so shortly, I want to give the welcome to Janina Smanui <clears throat> from the Vrije University of Amsterdam, to Martin van Starveren uh, from the Netherlands Water Partnership, to Mari Idowu from Obafemia Abolobo University from Nigeria, and uh, uh, Elia Lammers, Netherlands Enterprise Agency, uh, Daniel Isodori, Sokoin University of Agriculture, Tanzania, uh, Jacob Herman, worldwide in, in non-governmental organization from Mozambique, Janssen from the University uh, Czech and Tadiop de Sakar, and as well to Dr. Uh, Pierre Vielinga, Senior Professor of Water and Climate. I think that it is it is of justice that uh, because she is the um, the person that did a big effort in, in to put together this specialist, uh, the Dr. Kate Negas, uh, will be uh, our vice chair will be the person that will uh, take over the development of this webinar. So uh, thank you very much for your attendance and your interest. And uh, Dr. Kate Negas, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for uh, the introduction and also for welcoming our participants. Um, dear participants, this is a great pleasure to have you here. I also want to thank you all the panelists and all the presenters for joining us today. Uh, we have a very interesting program and we will start with the first presentations, presentation on salinity in sub-Saharan African countries by Yanina Smawi. First, I would like to also introduce uh, Ms. Maui. She is a researcher at Environmental Policy Analysis Department uh, of the Institute of Environmental Studies at the Freie University in Amsterdam. She has uh, her background in environment and resource management, as well as in the international relations, and she focuses on governance issues, especially on the governance landscape of international cooperative initiatives for saline agriculture, including regions such as Asia and Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which she will talk about today. Uh, dear Janina, we would like to invite you to start your presentation uh, and then we'll follow with the program. We can see it correctly in the presentation mode, so I believe everything works. Perfect. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be here today and to present the findings of a research project that we've conducted at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam together with the RVO during the last month. So in this project, we address the challenges of salinity in 12 yeah, sub-Saharan countries with the goal of better understanding salinity governance challenge, challenges and providing solutions on how to address them efficiently. So this map illustrates the spread of salinity issues, um, the available scientific knowledge, and also the policies that are already in place. We have used the traffic light categorization to visualize the extent of each variable. Looking, for example, at the K for knowledge variable, we see that salinity has been studied in several parts of the sub-Saharan region quite well, especially the region of the Horn of Africa, um, seems to be well analyzed so far. Lots of knowledge is also available about the spread of salinity in coastal areas and river deltas. More inland countries, however, such as Mali, Chad, or South Sudan, are still lacking good and comprehensive analysis. But looking closer at one specific country, Ethiopia is a very outstanding example. Because even though um, Ethiopia is a landlocked country, it is the strongest affected country by salinity in the whole region. So this implies that in general, not only coastal areas and river deltas are affected, but that also inland regions face severe salinity problems. In Ethiopia, salinity is often associated with poor irrigation methods. So this results in huge economic losses, not only in terms of loss of incomes for farmers, but also in terms of massive loss of productive land. To underline this, one of our Ethiopian interview partners stated that immediate action is needed in Ethiopia in order to prevent further salinization and to secure the livelihoods of farmers and communities. Looking further at impacts of salinity, we were able to um, yeah, reveal four main impact categories. So one example for an economic impact is the increasing loss of yields and productive lands that I already mentioned one slide earlier in the case of Ethiopia. Salinity also causes reduced water quality and the loss of biodiversity as some fish and plant species are just not able to survive in environments with increased salt levels. Looking at the social dimension, we can see that poverty will increase due to the threats on livelihoods and incomes, which might lead to changes in professions and even stronger migration to cities. Finally, we also found that uh, cultural aspects play a crucial role. For example, the change of environmental uh, of agricultural practices due to the fact that common practices are just not suitable anymore for salt affected land. In the report that we will publish on our research, many more impacts and further local adaptation methods are explained in more detail. So should you be interested in that, I recommend to have a closer look on the report that we will publish soon. But the impacts of salinization present also serious challenges, not only for farmers, but also for policymakers and international initiatives 
who try to yeah, address this issue, especially when you look at exacerbating factors such as climate change, resource scarcity, or population growth. So on the one side, there are social challenges such as political instabilities and poverty, but these social challenges are also coupled with economic constraints. For example, the mismatch between investment that is needed and the lack of public and private financial resources. So in total, this hinders effective responses to salinity-related problems. Also, cultural preferences for traditional crops are barriers to adopt to soil-tolerant varieties, for example. So addressing these interrelated challenges will require concentrated research efforts on the one side, but also collaborative strategies to mitigate the far-reaching effects of salinity and also to prevent for, um, its, worsening in the, its worsening in the future. Yeah, but after listening now to all the impacts and challenges of salinity, we also want to illustrate possible ways of governing salinity. This is why we looked at 30 different international cooperative initiatives, because such initiatives have the potential to address the challenges described in the, in the previous slides. So the analysis of these initiatives can be found again in more detail in our report. But today I want to highlight three exemplary variables that we've analyzed. For example, the map on the right shows the geographical distribution of the initiatives among our different focus countries. A nice finding is that in all of our focus countries, initiatives are already active, um, with Mozambique, Senegal, and Kenya hosting the most, and Somalia, South Sudan, and Chad having the fewest. The bar chart on the right um, shows the different functions that the initiatives perform to date. So even though multiple initiatives for salinity are already active in the region, they mainly focus on research and the development of pilot projects. Also information sharing and networking um, yeah, is a quite common activity that they perform. However, what is still missing are sufficient actors that provide financial support and that also commit to setting standards in the field. This might be because um, yeah, the majority now of the initiatives are constructed of either exclusively public actors or of public-private partnerships. So in the database, there is a notable absence of initiatives that are composed exclusively of private actors. And yeah, since private actors are usually associated with um, yeah, financing functions, this might be a good reason why the financing function here is still quite underrepresented. Looking at the third variable, this figure shows the SDGs that are addressed by the initiatives. So among the most addressed SDGs are zero hunger, no poverty, climate action, and also partnerships for the goals. This focus of the initiatives um, aligns very good with salinity adaptation measures. However, it is of course equally important to also focus on mitigating the problem as the prevention of further salinization plays a crucial role in handling the impacts. So three SDGs that still receive less attention are gender equality and the goal to reduce inequality, then also SDG 15, which is critical to protect biodiversity and also the goal related to innovation. So what we can see here is that even though the initiatives focus on quite, yeah, on very important SDGs, of course, um, yeah, there is still room for improvement when we are yeah, in the case of saline agriculture. But to, re, um, yeah, to wrap up now, I want to highlight three key findings and three recommendations of our research. So first of all, we found that, yeah, there is sufficient knowledge on coastal areas and river deltas, while data on inland salinity is still lacking. We therefore recommend conducting baseline research in the little study countries and to update and also deepen the analysis in well study countries, especially when it comes to inland and dryland salinity. Second, um, salinity has multiple negative impacts not only on the agricultural sector, but also on economic development, on migration patterns, and the bi biodiversity of land ecosystems. 
Here, we recommend improving knowledge sharing among farmers and also other affected stakeholders in order to mitigate or adapt to salinity and to especially support the most vulnerable groups such as youth and women. Finally, several salinity initiatives are already active in the region and yeah, they mainly focus on field activities and information and networking with a strong focus on food and water security and climate adaptation. So while this is already a very positive finding, we still recommend to support also initiatives that yeah, provide funding opportunities in order to fill the gaps and to create financial incentives for investors. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that this presentation gave you a brief overview on the outcomes of the project. And should you be further interested in the topic or should you have any questions, you can either reach out to me directly or yeah, I can recommend to have a closer look at the final report of our project that we will publish soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janina, for your presentation. Uh, it was a great overview of the situation in the region. And I would like to ask and encourage our participants to use question and answer option that you have at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question to Janina or to any of our participants, please type it there. Um, so for now, I would like also to ask whether there are any questions to Janina. I'm just gonna check both chat and Q&A to see if there are questions coming from our audience. If there are no immediate questions, I have one, maybe to give a little bit of time uh, for our audience to type in their, their message. If you were to choose one key message of your study, what would it be? Yeah, one key message uh, from the study that I, that I could conclude now after focusing on the topic for a while would be that salinity is a very severe problem in Sub-Saharan Africa, not only for the agricultural sector, but it's also inter like interconnected to different other sectors. And that it's very important to, first of all, improve knowledge on it, because yeah, in the case of Ethiopia, we can see that also landlocked countries are very strongly affected, but there are several landlocked countries where not enough knowledge is available yet, but also to focus on yeah, different ways how we can collaboratively address this issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just checking both of the chats, but I think that there are no immediate questions now. Great, if you, oh, there is one appearing. Uh, so perhaps I will just take one for the sake of time, let's see. Um, okay, so there is a question whether there are specific activities that the farmers are doing to deal with salinity. What would be the specific yeah. activities for of farmers uh, that uh, they are currently doing to deal with the salinity? Yeah, um, to answer these questions, we conducted different interviews with um, people who are active in the country or who work together with initiatives who focus on these countries. And there are actually quite some, some activities that farmers um, conducting, for example, some are using mulching, or there are also initiatives who foster the implementation of different crop varieties. And yeah, in our report, we uh, have a whole subchapter focusing on local adaptation strategies. So yeah, if you should be interested in what is happening in each country, um, have a closer look. Okay, thank you very much. Also a question, how many countries uh, were covered by the study? Yeah, um, we focused on 12 sub-Saharan countries um, in discussion also with our partners from the RVO and uh, yeah, interviews were able to conduct with five different countries. Great, thank you. Uh, perhaps also one more interesting question. Please explain how SDGs uh, relate to soil salinity issues. Which SDGs perhaps address it? Yeah. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned in the presentation, there are some SDGs which are quite relevant for salinity issues, since salinity issues address yeah, the agricultural sector, especially the SDG of zero hunger is quite related 
to, to the problem, but also different SDGs like climate adaptation or also the SDG that is related to protect biodiversity. Yeah, since salinity is a problem that affects different sectors, um, yeah, it's of course also interrelated with different SDGs. Thank you. And perhaps uh, one more interesting question that comes in the chat is, what is the salinity level in sub-Saharan soils? Yeah, this is actually a question that is quite hard to answer because during our research, we found that there is a wide range of, of measurements and also a very wide range of numbers that are available in scientific research. So this is actually also finding this de that demonstrates that research needs to be updated and also measurement um, methods needs to be standardized to get a yeah, impression on how severely Africa is affected in general. Thank you. This actually brings us to um, our second presenter today, Mr. Martin van Stavere, uh, who will tell us more about Saline Agriculture Map expansion to Sub-Saharan Africa. And in that reason, uh, in that way, also move to, to the mapping um, topic. I would like to introduce uh, Mr. van Staveren from the Netherlands Water Partnership. He's a co-convener of the Saline Water and Food System Partnership, which is hosted by the Netherlands Water Partnership in collaboration with the Netherlands Food Partnership. Um, Mr. van Staveren has a background in international land and water management from Bacheninga University and research. Martijn, uh, the floor is yours. Um, if you can share your presentation, I can check if it all works. Yes, perfect. Now we can see it in the presenter mode. Thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kate, and uh, the INSAS team to invite me to uh, give this short uh, pitch uh, for this interesting uh, webinar. Um, as I said, I will uh, talk mo mostly about uh, the saline agriculture map, um, but there are uh, three parts in this uh, presentation. So first I will explain a bit more about the objective that we have with this uh, website uh, and a bit of the background, uh, like how it started. Uh, then I will uh, move on with giving you a, a very short uh, tour uh, through the website. Um, in contrast of doing this online on the website itself, uh, I have prepared a number of PowerPoint slides so that also after uh, the completion of this webinar, the PowerPoint slides can be shared and you can still see uh, and recall the various um, um, uh, parts of the websites that we have been uh, visiting. And then uh, finally, uh, there are a number of uh, next steps and also ways to engage, um, to conclude as a kind of uh, call for contact or call for action, uh, a few notes on the, on the next steps. Um, if we start uh, with the objective of the Salen Agriculture uh, Map, uh, well, basically it is a website um, that we composed. Um, uh, I think since uh, about uh, one year, we have been uh, we have been actually working on it, um, and the um, specific objective we have is uh, formulated here. So uh, we want to disseminate information about Salen Agriculture projects, uh, its results, and lessons learned and also give you an insight into the international network of actors uh, working on saline agriculture. The development of the map uh, has been uh, materializing because of a collaboration between um, uh, well, quite a number of partnerships. Uh, Kate, you mentioned them already at the start. Um, so to start with, we have the Netherlands Food Partnership and the Netherlands Water Partnership. Uh, the two of us have um, initiated uh, another type of uh, collaboration uh, called the Saline Water and Food Systems Partnership. And this platform is intended to um, uh, well address the topic of salinity in quite a, a broad range. Um, so we look at, for example, uh, options of uh, prevention. So how can you prevent salinity and high uh, levels of salinity uh, in the first place? Uh, but also what could you do to, um, uh, to adapt to it? Uh, so quite a range of, um, of response uh, options. And sale and agriculture is one of the ways um, how you could actually do that. Uh, when we set up this uh, sale and water and food systems partnership, uh, we got in touch with the Free University Amsterdam because at the time 
the team was working on a project called Salad, uh, Salient Agriculture as an Adaptation to uh, Climate Change. Um, and it actually uh, led to quite a, a large overview of projects um, had that not many people uh, knew about um, uh, before, at least not as a complete set. Um, and we thought that this uh, overview of, of projects and initiatives uh, would be quite uh, interesting for the global network uh, to be compiled in a central place. <clears throat> So at a certain moment, we started uh, working on the website, uh, thinking about what could be an interesting uh, design for the website, what kind of information uh, should be presented. Uh, of course, how can we define the work uh, between uh, the different organizations involved, uh, the three partners that you see here. Uh, and after quite some time of, uh, of working, we uh, officially launched the website uh, during World Food Day uh, 2023 uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and at that moment, uh, the website contained about 90 different projects, largely based on the projects that uh, the Salad project has been um, um, uh, researching at the time. Then I will go to the to the second part uh, of this short pitch, uh, which is actually a short uh, tour through the website. Um, you see the website mentioned here on the screen. Um, I guess that uh, someone uh, has also shared uh, the website in the chat. So if you want, you can also uh, access it via the, the link in the chat. But just to uh, to give you a first uh, start, uh, you see the, the so-called landing page. So this is the, the first um, information you see. And you see also here that uh, the majority of the projects that we uh, compiled at the beginning were focused on uh, the European region and also the, the Mediterranean, uh, leading to about 90 projects uh, with different uh, colors. And you see it here in a bit more uh, detailed way, also explaining what these uh, colors mean. Um, in line with what uh, Janina told us uh, a few minutes back is that we also have a distinction between different type of projects. Yeah? So for example, uh, projects can be labeled based on the action area. Yeah? So really the operation of the project, where is the project uh, active, uh, operational, and that then can be a research project or a real implementation project. Um, another way to, uh, to label those projects is based on country, sometimes on the region. Uh, and finally, we have uh, a number of projects that were actually taking place in various countries at the same time. And in that case, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to, to allocate one uh, specific action area or one country for that particular project. Uh, so in that case, we often use an international secretariat uh, as a kind of pinpoint um, where you can ac access more information about the project. So if you would do that, if you would uh, click on one of those uh, uh, circles, then what happens is that you get a pop-up screen um, just as a very uh, small introduction to that particular project. Uh, you get a bit of an impression of the, the, ge the ge geographical setting of the project, but also of the uh, key stakeholders involved. Then if you uh, would click on the read more button, then you actually go to quite a, a nice um, a project description page. And this includes, uh, well, ma mainly uh, the, the information that you would expect there, of course. And so what is the, uh, the objective of the project, but also what are the actors? Uh, we often have a section on the results of the project. Uh, and quite frequently, we also have some uh, images, and so projects and even uh, a video, as you see here in this, uh, this particular project example. Um, then taking a, a few steps uh, back, uh, so the, the main uh, menu structure of the Salem AgriMap uh, website, um, uh, you can see it here, which, which are the uh, sub-pages we have created. And there are a number um, uh, here in the, um, in the red box that I would like to um, uh, explain a bit more. Uh, the first one is that um, we want to uh, further develop uh, the knowledge portal. Uh, the idea of this knowledge portal is that, it's an, that it is an up-to-date overview of academic research on the topic of sale and agriculture. But I would also expect, uh, for example, uh, information directed to specific audiences, uh, maybe a policy briefs for policymakers or uh, lessons learned from, uh, from local implementation. And that will all be compiled in an up-to-date uh, knowledge portal. 
Um, then the second, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I go one one step back. Uh, the second item uh, is on the way that uh, new projects can be added to the map. And of course, we have a number of guidelines for this. If you would click the link, you would uh, go to these guidelines and then you can read, for example, uh, about uh, the criteria that we use to um, uh, include a project on the map or not. Uh, one of the projects, uh, one of the criteria, of course, is that uh, it has to be a partnership. It should be a, a partner or a network of uh, partners uh, collaborating with each other, um, uh, working on the topic of saline agriculture. But there are a number of, uh, of other criteria as well. And in those guidelines, you can find more information. As I said, the, the projects that we have included so far are mainly based on uh, the European region and the Mediterranean. Um, but of course, we would also love to hear more about those 13 projects that uh, Janina mentioned, and maybe even others that are taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, to also have project examples and information about the network in this particular uh, region of the world. Uh, but also from Asia, uh, one of my colleagues is actually at this moment in Vietnam, uh, a low-lying delta area, also with uh, with large uh, salinity uh, challenges, and she has already spotted quite a number of initiatives that we will also add at some point uh, uh, to the map. Uh, then the final uh, one that I wanted to show you, uh, this is the, the, the third uh, sub-page uh, here, uh, is that we are um, uh, developing uh, and implementing a global campaign on salinization. Um, I have to say it is uh, quite a challenge to make this uh, this work and fly uh, because it's a, a voluntary commitment, uh, as it is called, uh, that was submitted to the United Nations 2023 Water Conference. Uh, that was the first um, international conference organized in about 50 years on water. Uh, and as uh, the Saline Water and Food Systems Partnership, we have submitted a commitment uh, to try to develop and implement uh, such a global campaign. Um, it would help us uh, a lot uh, if this campaign uh, is actually being implemented and is successful uh, in order to uh, put the issue of salinization higher on the agenda. Uh, it could feed into the, uh, the international stakeholder network um, and information about this we will also want to, uh, to add to the Salen Agrimap. Uh, that was it from, uh, from my side. Um, of course, concluding again. Uh, with the call for uh, for action. Um, if you have information about projects that you would like uh, to share uh, or add projects to the map, uh, please refer to the to the guidelines. But on the website, you will also find the contact details of some of my colleagues and myself, uh, so we can get in touch with you later about uh, more details. With that, I would like to, uh, to stop uh, and hand the floor back uh, to Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an uh, interesting presentation and also uh, sharing some details. We have also shared uh, the address of the website and the way how your project can be added to the map in the chat. So you can have a look there. And I see that there have been some questions. Maybe we have time for one short question. Um, so how do you ensure that integrity of data collected by the various projects on your, how do you ensure the, the integrity of the data collected um, from various projects on the website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for this uh, question. Uh, very good uh, to, to mention and, uh, and, and dive into this in a bit more detail, uh, because of course, uh, well, in the Netherlands, Europe, at different levels, there are um, uh, stronger restrictions on, on data storage and data dissemination. Um, what we are doing is making a distinction between the front end of the website and the back end. So the front end of the website gives you, uh, well, all, well, usually uh, publicly available information. Uh, and in the back end, that is basically our database uh, where we uh, store all the information uh, relevant uh, to the map. Um, so you can see it as a kind of uh, a source uh, or um, an image bank uh, or a repository where information is being uh, stored. Uh, this is only accessible by uh, the, the organizations behind this website. Uh, it will also not be made available publicly, but we only use it to extract the information uh, that is of use to the to the general audience on salinity projects. We have, uh, I think, a bit more about this in the in the guideline document actually, 
uh, and before uh, projects are actually being published. Um, I think we will uh, we will do a, a, a check uh, whether, for example, the information is complete and whether the organization submitting information is okay with the data being stored in the database. Great, thank you for that uh, explanation. And I believe that there is also some information available further on the website. So uh, thank you once again for your presentation. And now we will move um, from Sub-Saharan Africa and the general overview of the initiatives to the African continent with the presentation of Ms. Mari Idowu. So the presentation will shed some light on the INSA survey for the African region. And it will be presented by Ms. Mary Idowu from Obafemi Afolvo University in Nigeria. Uh, Ms. Idowu is a soil scientist of the Obafemi Afolvo University in Nigeria with a specialization in soil fertility and plant nutrition. Her studies on essentiality of sodium for crops, contributions to regulating soil water in water limiting environments, um, in addition to interaction with potassium in plant nutrition has given her recognition in the community of soil science uh, internationally and also nationally. Mary, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are looking forward to your presentation and the floor is yours. If we can see that the works. Mary, can you still hear us? I know that before we started our webinar, Ms. Idovu had a bit of a problem with the connection. So let me check again. Mary, can you still hear us? Okay, I think there is a problem on the uh, on the connection. Ah, yes, I think it's just working. Hello. 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 Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, good. Very happy to have you with us. And yeah. We're looking forward to your presentation. So the floor is yours. Please let me know if you'd like okay. the presentation. Thank you. I want to share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's working. Just if you could see it in the presentation. Presentation mode. That would be ideal. We don't see it in the presentation slide. mode. Okay. Slide. Slide show. Yeah. We'll see this slide more. We'll see this this slide show. Slide. Yeah. Please. In the view menu, uh, if you go menu. to the, it should work there. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, okay. At the bottom. Okay, good. Here okay. is two. Yes, perfect. We can see it. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Um Mary. good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Thanks for this opportunity given to me to make this presentation and also to coordinate the summary of the survey on the soil affected soils of sub sub Saharan Africa. Yes. Which one is it? Okay. Thank you. This is the outline of my presentation, the introduction, measurement of chemical parameters, mapping of a SAS, soil affected soils, monitoring soil affected soils, sustainable management of SAS. Indicators of sustainable 
soil management, the models, modernness of crop response to soil salinity and solicity, the irrigation methods and crop, uh, the major crop them cultivated under uh, saline conditions and the groundwater uh, monitoring. Well, we say that soil affected soils is a global challenge and also a challenge in the sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, salt, we see that could be as a natural uh, phenomenon or due to human activities. And looking at the origin, it could be as a result of climate, parent materials, and human activities. Also, we have uh, could be as a result of limited presentation and precipitation or the uh, improper irrigation uh, practices or inadequate drainage systems. All these have been indicated to contribute to salinity in sub Saharan Africa. So looking at the uh, survey, 16 countries uh, submitted a uh, survey. I mean, 16, the experts submitted the questionnaires from uh, 16 countries. And we have varying uh, values for the soils under these conditions. And looking at the measurements used, you know, different parameters in measuring as salinity. The CEC is one of the major parameters. And the most countries use the method of ammonium acetate extraction at the pH of seven, while the sodium adsorption ratio calculation was based on calcium, magnesium, and sodium. But we have wide variation in the methods being used. We have some countries that they use different uh, methods, especially for uh, ESP, that is uh, exchangeable sodium percentage. But for CEC, most of them use uh, ammonium acetate and the, as shown, in this table, we also have a, we have a 60 countries. This is for the rest of the countries. So for pH, pH in water at one to one ratio and one to 2.5 ratio is, is the major uh, method being used for pH. But we have countries like Cameroon, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe that they also use 0 0.01 molar of calcium chloride. And when this method is used, it removes the seasonal, seasonal effect. That is the period of the year when the samples are collected, will not have any effect on the values to obtain. But however, there's the need for harmonization of methods. Also looking at the classification, most country use American classification system described by Richard 1954 and the FAO method. And also looking at the threshold, you know, where we are talking of salinity, we look at the electrical con conductivity that measures the concentration of uh, salt. And most countries use four decimals per meter. Although we have other countries like Togo that used a different value. We also have my, the, uh, Mozambique also used the threshold of 15. For sodicity, that is for sodic soil, where sodium is the dominant uh, salt, the threshold generally is when the, uh, the value is above 15%, such as if where sodium concentration is above 50 percent such a soil is considered a sodic soil. However, we have other countries that use a threshold of 10 percent. Countries like Sierra Leone, South Africa, 
they use value of 6% ESP as their own threshold, still emphasizing the need for harmonization. And then looking at the mapping, map, you know, using digital soil map. For most of the countries, there are no data, no data on the mapping of SAS, not for soil, but SAS. Why we have some that use you know, very uh, large scale mapping. So we need uh, studies on detail, I mean, high scale, you no know, scale that is um, at lower scale uh, to take the maps and to get uh, uh, you know, precise information about the soil, soil affected um, soils. And uh, this also supports the presentation of the, the, the uh, just concluded presentation. And this is another table showing the same scenario. And also looking at uh, the management practices. Almost all the management practices indicated in the question here were adopted, but at varying levels, at varying levels. And we could see that uh, the using of chemical, that is like gypsum, where they have an iso 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 sodium concentration is being practiced. Also, use of voucher. Voucher is another novel uh, technique that is being uh, introduced. So some countries are doing that. They are also using it. And we also have all other practices, but being adopted, but at varying levels. Looking at indicators, most countries adopt the indicators outlined in the FAO, which con consists of the soil productivity, organic carbon content, and bulk density. But we have others that also use other indicators. But generally, there are, there, there, there are limited uh, data on the indicators being used. And also looking at the crop losses, uh, no critical data on the losses, but we have uh, information in some countries that the yield are generally low under this uh, so, uh, salinity. And looking at the crops, the types of crop being um, pr produced, being cultivated, rice rank first, you know, highest amongst the crops. Well, I want to draw attention to barley. Barley has capacity as uh, re reported by Mashna, 1998. Barley has capacity to utilize water efficiently, but it is very, uh, I think only one country is planting it now. So this is one of the crops that we can fall back to, as well as wheat and soybean. Also looking at models. Yeah, some countries are adopting model, countries like South Africa. But it was reported that the kind of parameters being measured could not, they are not suitable for management purposes. So we really need to come up with the parameters that will be suitable for management purposes. When we are talking of modeling, we develop our home for uh, SAS. And this is showing the irrigation quality, quality of irrigation water. We could see different uh, websites showing what has been done. And looking at irrigation practices, surface irrigation at different subtypes being practiced as well as a, a speckler irrigation and the manual irrigation. And crops that are mainly used under irrigation, I've mentioned it, rice ranked first in the questionnaire, while barley that will perform better have not been introduced. And this table is showing the results. And the response to uh, brackish water, that is uh, water with very high concentration of sodium. So some countries 
like uh, Cameroon, what, uh, Djibouti, Liberia, Ghana, South Africa, and Togo are using this kind of water. Nigeria is not using, and believe it that we have sufficient, Nigeria has sufficient water, fresh water to use. Why Cameroon is very good at this as of now, they sell, they have regulations for using black, blackish water for irrigation, but they are planning this for the future. So this is, a, is an opportunity for us to use blackish water and cultivating crops that can still survive and will not be able to absorb salts because crops have different methods of eliminating salts from their systems. There are different mechanisms being adopted by crops to survive under this condition. Also, there are minimum data on water, groundwater monitoring. Kenya stand out in this. Kenya has, with the support of the Dutch Ministry of Development Corporation, has um, a system monitoring, that is monitoring uh, the, um, the groundwater. But it was reported that this monitoring is centralized. So there's the need to decentralize this system and for other countries also to learn from them. So in summary, limited data are available on salt affected soils in Sub-Saharan Africa and no application of digital approaches for managing this soil exists. Inappropriate management of irrigation water, especially like even blockage of irrigation system was also reported. The lack of harmonization of methods for assessing SAS in Sub-Saharan Africa and no government involvement in, in sustainable management of SAS. And finally, limited attention has been directed to SAS engaging stakeholder management, stake, stakeholder partnership in the Sub-Saharan Africa. So in conclusion, there are high opportunities to overcome challenges of SAS in, in the Sub-Saharan Africa for national, regional, and the global development. I want to appreciate the FAO once again for this opportunity and also for my university, Abafemi Awulawa University, for giving me this platform, even to develop my career and also for my family for the support they provided. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary, for this fantastic presentation and sharing with us the results of the questionnaire and also passing the important information about the state of uh, salinity. Uh, on the salt affected soils in African continent. Thank you. And you're staying Thank with you. us because you're also part of the roundtable discussion to which we'll move now. So okay. I would like to introduce um, the uh, participants of our panel roundtable that we will have today. And I would like to start with um, Ms. Ella Lammers from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Um, Ella Lammers is a senior advisor at the Netherlands Enterprise, uh, Enterprise Agency, which is an executive body of the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy uh, that helps business owners run sustainable, agricultural, innovative and international businesses. And in this role, um, Ella works on topics such as global public goods, sustainable development, private public partnerships, food security, sustainable water issues. Uh, she is involved in several projects, um, including, for example, the Coasts project in Bangladesh, uh, but also the salinity in 12 African countries that was presented uh, today. Ella, thank you for joining us and welcome to the panel. Uh, I would like to also introduce Mr. Daniel Isdori from Sokon University of Agriculture in Tanzania. Um, Mr. Isdori is a soil scientist and agronomist working as a lecturer and a pedologist at Sokorn University of Agriculture in uh, Morogoro in Tanzania. Uh, he has a background uh, in agronomy, soil science and land management. Welcome to our panel and thank you for joining us as well. Then we also have Mr. Jakob 
Herman from Weltweite uh, NGO in Mozambique. Uh, Mr. Herman is an agriculture and development specialist with a background in agronomy and African and Asian st studies. His previous experience focused on technical advisor in Mozambique, and he has also developed many skills and um, development-oriented projects related uh, to salinity. Welcome and thank you for joining us today as well. And we also have uh, Mr. Jean Sene with us from the Université Sheikh Anta Diop de Dakar in Senegal. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sene is a lecturer at the Institute of Environmental Sciences at the Cheikh Anta Diop University in Dakar, and he has background in project management at Natural Sciences and holds a PhD in Environmental Sciences. Welcome as well to our panel. Thank you for joining us today. We have a number of wonderful uh, speakers. Perhaps, um, Mary, if I can ask you to stop sharing the screen, then we can see um, everyone yes. on the panel. Okay. And with so much interesting information that we have already heard, I would like to ask uh, an opening question and then also open uh, again and invite our audience Thank to you. share their questions in the Q&A section. So please use the box that you have. Um, my first question to the whole panel uh, is after having seen some research research on salinity in sub-Saharan region, what do you think is the most important challenge and opportunity of the soil salinity for the country um, on which your work focuses? And perhaps with uh, all the recent presentations, I would like to first direct this question to uh, Mr. Daniel Eisdori. Uh, if we could hear your perspective first, that would be great. And then we will follow up with the uh, with other participants. Ah, uh, you're still muted. All right, I hope you get me. Yeah, now we can hear you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I would like us to appreciate for your uh, invitation. My uh, short response to, uh, to your question could be, uh, I've actually learned that um, we are facing uh, some challenges in the region, especially uh, on the very uh, problem, understanding the extent and magnitude. Therefore, we have uh, the limited data on the extent and magnitude of salt affected soils in the, in the region. And uh, you know, this is a problem which is actually known so far in research and its effects are also known uh, so far but uh, its management will actually require the information. And uh, in the region, we still lack um, reliable data uh, describing the magnitude and extent of the problem. And therefore, I think we still have a lot to be done in this area as well. But also, I think uh, we have an opportunity that uh, we can actually uh, make the benchmark uh, from the literature that has been done a lot. A lot is, is actually being done, especially emanating from INSAS, that we, we now have a lot of information with regard to the management of salt affected soils. And therefore, we probably need a lot. I mean, we have um, an opportunity that we can make a lot to actually manage the problem and uh, help to, um, to, to maintain the sustainability of agricultural lands. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, this is a, a really good point. So we still need more data, we need more research, and a lot is happening. We can see that INSAS is also taking initiative. And I'm wondering, um, how does it look like from the perspective of Mr. Jean Sene from uh, Senegal? So if we could hear about your perspective, um, that would be fantastic as well. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, I think in Senegal, uh, particularly salinization is a very, very big uh, problem. Uh, the measures uh, show that uh, near 45% of arable lands are affected by salinity. And I think the two major challenges are first, 
to help uh, uh, familial agriculture to stop uh, losing um, uh, arable land because they are faced to, uh, they have to abandon their land because of salinity. And uh, we must uh, ameliorate the knowledge related to salt affected soils by research. Uh, but what is uh, said uh, by Maria is uh, applicable in Senegal. We have uh, many methods, but there is no harmonization. Uh, we have many actors, but uh, every actor is uh, working in his field. There is no, um, how to say it, synergy. Yeah. And uh, we face to, uh, how to say it, climate change. Because, as you know, the main uh, salinization process in Senegal is primary salinization, intrusion of the um, uh, sea water of uh, Atlantic Ocean. In the main rivers, we have uh, Senegal, Sin Salum, Casamas, and also Gambia. And uh, this intrusion of sea water uh, made uh, the soils and the ground, uh, uh, where the water, what the water table, uh, saline. Uh, in in this situation, we need, uh, we must develop synergy. We must uh, work together in order to uh, find right now solutions, but. Uh, at the same time, uh, we must uh, have to prospective prospective uh, technology uh, to reduce uh, salin uh, salinization uh, of the um, arable land in Senegal. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. So harmonization, collaboration, and climate change as the well three main take aways from, from your message. And I'm very much wondering if uh, Mozambique, so the other side of African continent is facing similar challenges and also comes up with similar solutions. So I would like to give the voice to uh, Mr. Jakob Herrmann now. Yes, um, thank you, Kate. And also from my side, thanks for the invitation and uh, for the opportunity to being part of this panel. Um, to answer the question um, regarding the most important challenges in Mozambique, from my point of view, um, is actually a similar. I would like to agree with my previous speakers, the lack of um, yeah, conclusive data on the concrete extent of salinity, also maybe of the um, concrete um, characteris characteristics of salt affected lands, um, in, like we talk about sodicity, salinity, and maybe also other uh, accompanying um factors uh, um yeah so so factors uh, which intersect with the problem so i think that is one of the main challenges also for mozambique um, a, a lack of respective data um on which then one could build um yeah targeted uh, um, responses on a national level um at the same time i think um there is, I think you also asked for opportunities, and I see that uh, especially on a local level, because um, soil salinity is not as such a new phenomenon, but uh, so to say has been there. So that means that farmers, according to, to our knowledge, to our experiences, um, have already pretty well developed um, approaches how to how to yeah farm under salt affected um, conditions. So I think this is an interesting entry point for all um, current and future research um, to use those to use that local knowledge and build on that for, for any possible solutions yeah thank you this is very interesting point because indeed farmers are those applying uh, various soil water and plant management practices 
um, available to deal with the salinity. So then my question is what actually hinders uh, the implementation of these practices and what supports them? And I know that among us, there is a person that's been working many different projects, uh, Ms. Ella Lammers. So I was wondering what is her perspective on uh, potential bottlenecks and also supporting factors for projects um, in relation to salinity? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, I came here mostly to listen to uh, and to hear all the lessons and practices from uh, people working in the countries themselves. Um, so I think I'm a little bit more modest. Um, but what we see in, 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 in different uh, projects is, for example, the coast project in, um, in uh, Bangladesh. I think that the situation in Bangladesh, although it is Asia, it's maybe a little bit the same as in um, uh, Senegal and Mozambique, because it's also a seawater intrusion and um, um, uh, affected soils because of the seawater. Uh, we have a major program there where um, farmers have access to salt-tolerant seeds and also have support to implement um, the right practices for uh, saline agriculture. And that works quite well. Uh, but when I went there to, uh, to Bangladesh, then everybody I spoke to, whether it was a farmer or the knowledge institutes or people from the extension staff, from the agricultural services, Everybody said, well, water is the, is the most challenging and is the limiting factor. If you want to scale up these practices, we do not have sufficient um, irrigation water from sufficient quality. And um, so what we often see is that projects are either implemented because of agricultural programs, trying to support agriculture, or it is water-related projects. But we do not often see programs which focus on both water and agriculture. And that is why I think that this topic is so interesting, because you really need the, this um, nexus of water, agriculture, food, climate change, and all work together. So I do recognize what I heard in the speakers before me, that um, there is a need for collaboration and synergy and to working together. And, but it is also very difficult because it is easy to say, but if you look at water management and all the different actors you need for sound water management, that is already very complicated. Then if you want to align that also with all those actors active in agriculture, it gets more and more complex. Um, also in the Netherlands, eh? it's no different in our country. Um, um, so any program that can support this uh, co cooperation between water and agriculture, I think that is very important. Thank you very much. This Thank is a, indeed an interesting point that we need collaboration between water experts, food experts, agricultural experts, soil experts as well. Um, and I was wondering whether Mary could also comment on that, on the factors supporting and hindering different soil, water, and crop management practices bringing together this nexus topic. What do you think? How does it work for, for you? Thank you very much. I observed that soil testing, soil water, crop testing, very, very important. But uh, there are lack of uh, infrastructure or facilities for laboratory testing. So that is another factor. Then we have dams, but the dams are poorly maintained. I read uh, articles that evaluated accumulation of salts because the drainage uh, system of the irrigation were blocked and resulting in salt in, in the water and the salinity. And also irrigation is, uh, the demand for irrigation is increasing because of climate change. So we experience drought condition, especially during the critical stage of crop production, during the reproductive stage. So farmers need irrigation, but this has to be done effectively. And also we have crops, identification of crops that can still, that have a high, uh, water use efficiency is very important. 
along with other uh, submissions like collaboration and normalization of methods. Also, we have mangrove. The mangrove uh, land not sufficiently or efficiently utilized. That's very close to the sea, you know, where some parts of uh, Nigeria, some states in Nigeria. So mangrove are also is the type of crop that can bring economic you know, development if uh, effectively uh, managed. Thank you. Thank you for this input, Mary. This is indeed a good point. And also one of the questions mentioned by our audience, which crops uh, we can use in salt affected soils, which yes. crops, and which plants can uh, really enhance the use, sustainable use of salt affected soils. And there is also a comment uh, in the chat that we should not forget the farmers and um, because they need to be professors in all aspects, in water, in soil and yes. in production at the same yes. time when dealing with salinity. So indeed an important point. And that also brings me to the next next question. So what should be the focus of initiatives? Uh, Janina has just presented a couple of initiatives, around 30 of initiatives working across uh, sub-Saharan African countries and the also uh, countries uh, that are neighboring with the region. So here my question is, what should be the focus of the initiatives, including private sector and research organizations that are willing to invest in sub-Saharan Africa? Um, and here I would like to first um, ask uh, Mr. Jean Sene for the input. What do you think should be the main focus of initiatives that would like to invest? Uh, thank you, Kate. I think the, uh, the, um, uh, the first thing is to scaling the technologies. You have many, many types of uh, technologies to fight against um, salinity. We have hydromechanics technologies, dams, dike. We have chemical, chemical technologies. We have biological, uh, like um, uh, how to say it, using some uh, how to say it, plants, some, some plants uh, to restore uh, soil affected uh, salt affected soils. And we have some good results, uh, especially in, in Senegal uh, because uh, due to the hydromechanical technologies, we arrive to uh, restore some land and to make, make again a uh, culture of rice because the most uh, crops affected by salinization in Senegal is the rice. And uh, we, 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 how to say it, uh, rice is the most um, uh, in nutritional uh, nutrition of uh, the population, rice is the most uh, crops uh, uh, used. In this case, we have to scale uh, the technologies in order to uh, have uh, um, to ameliorate the efficacy of these technologies and also. Um, how to say it, uh, capacity building, yeah, capacity building of local actors, because they face two the problems, but sometimes they are, they have now, they can have uh, uh, local knowledge to fight against, but there is no technical support, there is no financial uh, support. Uh, that's why I think uh, the initiatives must uh, uh, focus on uh, capacity building of uh, local communities and uh, financial support. First, to um, how to say it, um, to make uh, technologies, but also to create as 
income generating activities uh, in order to fight against uh, poverty. Sorry for my bad English. <laughs> Thank you. It's perfect. Thank, Thank you very right. much. <laughs> and I see a hand from uh, Mr. Jorge. Sorry, please go ahead, Jorge. And then Thank you. Go. Thank you, great. I, uh, I just wanted to make a comment uh, on, uh, on what Mary said about that they have mangroves. And uh, mangroves is a very special, very highly sensitive ecosystem. And in, in my experience, I have uh, sad histories of, of the uh, mangroves transformations in Mexico, Ecuador, Cuba, Thailand, and, and many other countries. And so I think that, uh, mm, well, the, the human profit of such uh, ecosystem should be, um, how to say, adapted to the nature of, of the ecosystem instead of trying to transform it, transform in any way, mm -hmm. not only not, not only the, 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 the mangrove, but as well the, the areas that are of influence of this with some kind of salinity upwards in the, in the topographical sequence. So it is, uh, it is uh, not always well understood, but I think it is very, very important. And nowadays, it is paid uh, increasing attention even by countries <clears throat> under development of the importance of uh, preserving such ecosystems. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Jorge. And um, now I would like to give voice to Mary because she also wanted to comment as I have seen. Thank you. We are looking at initiatives that we can adopt. From the presentation I made, I could see, especially irrigation monitoring, very important. In Nigeria, we have dams, but the dams are grossly underutilized. So the dams are just there. The level of production is very low. So system to make use of dams is, is a critical one that I think will result into, because in the northern part of the country, we have conflicts between the farmers and the housemen. And because of lack of or insufficient grasses for the animals, because of uh, less water and low soil infertility, and possibly because of uh, this organization of chemicals, you know, chemical on a composition now working against of the surviving of crisis. So initiatives to bring, to restore the land and to use water efficiently, we need it. And we also need to understand the soil composition, uh, the chemical composition of soil. I read that when we are talking about uh, salinity, or so this city, it goes beyond the cations alone. That even borum, high concentration of borum could be a challenge to crops, and the crops will not survive. Because my own area of specialization is soil fertility and plant nutrition. And each uh, nutrients or element has a role to play in the in the crop uh, surviving or uh, crop production. So irrigation system is very critical. It's an initiative that I would say for Nigeria and I believe for other countries as well. We need it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I see hand from uh, Mr. Jean Sene and Pierre Velinga. So I would like first to give voice to Mr. Jean uh, Sene and then to Mr. Pierre Velinga. And after that, since we're slowly running out of time, I would like to give the voice to all the participants for the final short comments, short pitch to close uh, the discussion and then move to the next part of the program. But first, please, Mr. Jean Sene. Thank you, Kate. I, I, uh, related to mangroves, because uh, in Senegal, we have also uh, uh, mangroves uh, forest. Uh, and uh, 
the the in add to salinization we have another problems it is acidification because the material where we have mangrove is rich in pyrites uh, FAS2 and the oxidation of uh, pyrites on jarosite uh, conduct to uh, acidification uh, like uh, sulfuric uh, sulfuric acid uh, and the consequence is we we face uh, we have two problem now uh, salinization problem and acidification, acidification. problem directly uh, direct, uh, re related to degradation of, uh, of uh, mangrove uh, forest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an important comment indeed about the restoration and maintenance of the mangrove forests. And now I would like to uh, give the voice to uh, Mr. Pier Vellinga. Also, let me introduce Mr. Pier, who would be uh, who would be today summarizing our discussion. So he's uh, recognized as one of the Netherlands' leading environmental scientists of the impacts of climate change, and through his career has been involved in many important um, positions, being the director of the IVM Institute at the FU University, um, and also the. Uh, the, the, the leader of uh, the United Nations uh, Environmental Program uh, and the United Nations Development Program. Um, Pierre, please, the floor is yours. Ah, uh, you're muted, so we cannot hear you yet. There you go. All right. Thank you, Kate. Well, I was not the leader of such major UN organizations, but I, I was very active in setting up the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel, and the whole climate convention. But at that time, there was also a convention on desertification, led mainly by African people. And in the 90s, there were efforts to develop this whole convention on desertification in parallel with the convention on climate change. Well, the climate change, one, succeeded because there were also opportunities for industry and what have you. And desertification, well, uh, it more or less died. Uh, while today reveals again how important it is to, to look at not just salinization, but at degraded lands like they are very many and growing in Africa. So it's almost the same agenda as this agenda for desertification because it was also about that this land is slowly degrading and climate change will add to this degradation because of water shortages and what have you. Uh, but just listening carefully, uh, I, I, I first want to make the point that this whole salinization of soils is a long-term issue. It will not go away. It will still be there 10, 20, 30 years from now. So you need a strategic mm -hmm. approach. And in such a strategic approach, I more or less found four lines of, of action. And one is that I like really is this global campaign on the nexus, on, on raising the issue on the international agenda. Uh, and that can be done in a kind of, well, in the INSAS network, it could could raise some money and set up a global panel to discuss it and to, to promote it and then also to sensitize the major climate funds and development banks. Because I anticipate there will be some uh, climate adaptation money on the market, channeled through green banks and what have you. But uh, we must make sure that a significant amount goes to agriculture and using degraded lands, salinized lands for food production. So, so one would be the campaign Second would be maybe including in this campaign to synthesize the uh, development uh, 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 banks and the climate funds. Uh, second would be really to do pilots and pilots and pilots. And because we still know very little while farmers on the ground have some experience, but we should learn from one another. So uh, with some subsidies, help these farmers to test certain practices do research, not just in the laboratory, but together with the farmers uh, and, and, and combine it with training. 
you know, like doing a pilot, but include a, a lot of farmers in a training scheme. So first the campaign, second is pilots and research on the ground and training. And the third one, equally important, and it was mentioned by many of you, just data gathering, monitoring, uh, method development. So all what you need to allocate uh, assistance or help or strategies. So I see three lines. One is uh, this global campaign, including the climate fund organizations. Two is uh, pilots, research and training. And three is, uh, is data methods, monitoring and research methods as well, like on the potassium, because there is so much we still don't know. But you know, we cannot first do the research and then tell the world we have a problem. We already now know we have a problem. So we should start the campaign simultaneously with trying to raise money to do testing, testing, and testing, and learn through testing and training. And thirdly, develop this uh, this, this method, a kind of universal method on, on measuring salinity, making certain categories, because uh, locally it will differ very much from place to place. So I would, uh, Kate, I would recommend for you and INSAS to develop at least a long-term agenda. And I hope so, one way or another, these three elements uh, come back one way or another. Thank you very much Pierre, for this intervention and also listing three points uh, that we may take on the agenda. I think this is really good direction bringing uh, an important elements that appear here during the discussion and that also slowly bring us uh, to the end of this roundtable discussion. So for the last sentences, I would like to ask um, every participant to share with us a few last um impressions, a few last concluding remarks from their side. And I will start with Ms. Ella Lammers. Um, please share with us a few um, statements that we should take as a uh, take as a uh, key message back home from your side. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, also for organizing this very important uh, webinar, and I enjoyed being part of it. Um, I think we had a very interesting discussion, but mainly also on the um, the coastal uh, salinization. And I think that the importance of the research done by the IVM is that there's also a huge problem on arid salinization. Um, um, I've seen many programs and projects in Ethiopia, but while working on these pro programs, nobody spoke of salinization, not from the water uh, projects and not from agricultural projects. And still, it's also a major problem in Ethiopia. So I think that that's, uh, um, yeah, there's, there's a need for more focus on also on the other countries uh, in Africa. Second, and I think that is also why we need more cooperation and we should not work in these silos. I think we should also look at competing claims because in coastal areas, you see that also the aquaculture is being supported, but they need more uh, salt water. Uh, so in uh, like in Bangladesh, the polders, the farmers doing uh, um, aquaculture, they will uh, ask for more uh, intrusion of salt water and the farmers doing agriculture and trying to, um, to, to, to work on sandline uh, agriculture, they need less. Um, and uh, I asked around because this is not really my background, so I wanted to know is there a competing claim, so what, what is this about, but nobody really knows. So I think that also deserves a little bit more focus and attention. So thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, good concluding, strong concluding points. Very important indeed. And now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Jakob Herrmann for his concluding statements. Yes, thank you very much. I also um, found this uh, webinar pretty interesting. Um, I take away a lot of uh, interesting insights and ideas. Um, maybe shortly commenting on uh, the intervention from um, Dr. Willinga. Um, well, um, I, um, yeah, I think that that uh, the, the the suggestion of uh, practical pilots, etc., is is very important, and um, I hope to since we actually in our work in Mozambique have tried to to follow that approach. Um, but actually encountered the difficulty, as you mentioned, of 
uh, targeted financing options. Um, so I think I, I, I have mm -hmm. the feeling often that with the topic of salinity of saline agriculture, you don't really fit into the silos um, that are existent at the moment in, in well, development cooperation, uh, uh, financing of, of research and development activities. So I think um, the suggested uh, way forward would definitely help um, the existing initiatives. And um, a second aspect, which I also hope to, um, well, to happen starting from from this interesting interaction today to have more regional and um, transnational interactions and and possibly collaborative action yeah be it knowledge transfer or even uh, more concrete uh, project implementation yeah these are my my main takeaways today thank you Thank you for these important messages. Uh, very good to hear your perspective. And now I would like to invite the, uh, Mr. Daniel Istori to share uh, his uh, final perspective and his uh, main take home messages. Thank you very much, Kate. I would like first to thank you very much and I found this webinar very interesting for my side. Uh, mine will be uh, simpler to add uh, some issues from Dr. Velinga. I found a lot have been captured when he was presenting his ideas. So I would just like to add one thing that um, in the efforts to, um, uh, to work or to fight against uh, or, you know, uh, whichever way about salt affected soils, we actually, I would like to suggest a holistic approach. We have been having, like in Tanzania, we have been having two isolated efforts in dealing with salt affected soils. And therefore you find that the sustainability of the efforts is very low due to lack of holistic approach. For example, in terms of um, management options or strategies, we normally have some kind of isolated efforts, maybe uh, from the researchers' points of view, but we have a lot, as men have said, that uh, farmers have a lot about management of uh, these soils because they have been dealing with, the, uh, with such soils for a long time. And therefore, we can have um, an idea of framing an integrated soil, uh, affected soils management. And I've tried to make an acronym here that is uh, I -S -A -S -M, ISASM, an integrated soil, uh, affected soil management. But uh, I think after we have made, I mean, we have framed the holistic approach of uh, dealing with salt affected soil, which is actually going to aim to bring different factors from professional, I mean, the agronomists, soil scientists, uh, you know, the environmentalists, the land use planners. Now, more to the political figures because of whichever uh, we are trying to um, build uh, for it to be sustainable and be applied um, more widely, we need some policy implications. And therefore in this uh, holistic approach, then we can raise the awareness as Dr. Belinga said, and then we bring in the political uh, will um, to, to understand the problem and you know the effect of salt affected soil as one of the major forms of chemical land degradation, which is you know contributing to low crop yields. And therefore, once we do that, we are able to bring different actors and therefore devise sustainable solutions to, uh, to whatever we are trying to uh, to, to seek for uh, the salt affected soils. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And this sustainability aspect also comes up as an important contribution. Thank you. Um, okay, may I ask Ms. Mary Idovu to share uh, her message to the audience as well? Thank you very much. It has been an empowering uh, meeting. I would like to add that, uh, just as it was mentioned, that we are looking at degraded soils. Sub-Saharan Africa, it has been reported that fertilizer usage in the region is the lowest in the whole world. And people 
are still discouraging the use of fertilizers. So how we say that as part of our efforts, ensuring the quality of fertilizer is very important. So we, dis we discovered that some fertilizer materials have substantial amounts of sodium. And also we have to create awareness about the importance of fertilizer. It is a plant's food. As we are using organic materials to sustain the structure, soil structure, we have to use chemical as well, but in the a, in a, in a right way. So we have to carry that along in our research because we are looking at our efforts, because we are looking at holistic approach in solving this problem and also influencing the government, the political will to do this, coming up with political, I mean, policies that we encourage this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Attention. Yes. Also for highlighting this aspect of the importance of the government and the policymakers as well. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Dr. Jean Sene, please, uh, your final message as well. Okay. Thank you, uh, Kate. Thank you for organizing this uh, very interesting uh, webinar. I agree with uh, the um, uh, prospective uh, proposition made by the panelists. And also, I think uh, sub-Saharan uh, Saharan countries must be helped to uh, leveraging biotechnology and salt tolerant crops. I think it is uh, a field we can explore in order to, uh, how to say it, uh, valorize salt affected soils and also developing uh, biosaline agriculture. Uh, because due to the climate change, uh, I, I am not sure that uh, it can be we 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 can we can uh, uh, reduce um, salt affected uh, salt affected soils, but I think we we also um, have to uh, find some ways to uh, value val evaluate evaluate the the actual uh, salt uh, uh, soils in order to produce crops to produce as a as a nutrition for population and also we have to work together uh, private sector research uh, uh, farmers in order to scale up the most efficient uh, and less less costly technologies uh, to fight uh, against uh, salinization. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Now I would like to pass the voice to Mr. Pierre Vellinga for the final conclusions and then also to Jorge to close our meeting. Well, there is not much I have to add to all that has been said and I support the last uh, uh, Dr. Senna also about uh, biotechnology and uh, looking into salt tolerant plants, and uh, but for the rest I, I I I stay with my my major recommendations to do pilots and research on the ground uh, to launch the a, a global campaign uh, and and to develop common methods to make things comparable and of course as Ella Lemmer said to. Uh, to pay as much attention to coastal areas as well to arid areas. This is very relevant for Africa. And one way or another, you know, Africa and Europe are increasingly linked to one another and becoming increasingly interdependent. And uh, well, right now, Europe still has, has the money, but uh, uh, Africa has the youth and we'll have to work together on this topic. And, uh, and I think then, uh, uh, starting this global campaign, doing pilots together, developing methods is, is a very good vehicle to increase cooperation between Europe and Africa.
and Sub-Saharan Africa. Fantastic. Thank you very much for this closing remarks. And also my big thanks to all the panelists that joined us today. Uh, dear Chair, dear Jorge, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, dear panelists, uh, for this uh, very interesting exchange of info and, and opinions on the topic. As uh, all of you, and, and especially in, in, in quite in, in exact, exact words of, of Dr. Piel Vielinga, salinity is uh, long lasting, uh, difficult to afford. And, uh, uh, well, it seems that the, a set of, of uh, approaches it is needed to deal with that, because the uh, main vector of salinization it is the water is the scarcity of water. So uh, for uh, the idea, quite nobody speaks about the reclamations of salt-affected soils because the huge amount of water that it is needed for leaching the salts. So new ideas of adaptation of, of such systems are needed, including, of course, this saline agriculture, uh, trying to use all the biotechnology existing uh, so microarrays, uh, uh, transgenic uh, plants, and as well a graduation of the of the different uh, plants. Some of them, uh, in in a similar way as as we do in the allowing soils to rest uh, for in, in for cropping in normal soils. Uh, uh, maybe uh, some stages of uh, establishing some kinds of plants of halophytes that can take. A, a bit uh, out the uh, of, of of amount of salt from soils, so or combining uh, 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 agriculture with some kind of fisheries in in some in some cases. So there is a, a big a big field to explore for finding new solutions for such big increasing uh, world, worldwide spread problem. And and for today, I think that uh, some ideas were over the table. And, uh, and recommendations, and I am very, very grateful on, on behalf of INSAS to have this info that will be shared uh, later in, in other modalities. So to all panelists and as well to all, all attendants that were uh, numerous and, and they were uh, constant in the following the, the seminar, that's important, that's a good indicator. Thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, I hope to, to see you soon, to meet you soon in person if possible, but if not, in the next webinar that we will organize. Thank you for your attention and participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yes.